Excellent. So look, most of those who are attending, um, I guess are probably here already with a couple of people to come. Um, so welcome everyone and thank you for attending the very second Computer Vision in production online event. Uh, my name's Anthony Kelly and I'm your host. Um, and then first off, look, before I start, I want to say thank you to Farshid, Manuel and Ivana for putting themselves forward, uh, for speaking at this event. Um, and then for everyone who's interested, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the computer vision in production, um, online events and, and what we're doing. So I suppose look, today is the second event since we started back in January. Um, the goal is, is to hold at least one technical online webinar per month. Recordings will be posted on my YouTube channel. And then we also side by side with the computer vision and production events. I also host a podcast series. So again, also started back in January as uh, about eight or nine episodes available um, of the podcast series. So the only difference that I would say between the podcast series versus the meetup, it's less technical, you know, less sort of code samples, less deep diving because it can be very complex to really understand uh, if someone's deep diving into code uh, via a audio only platform so we kind of like to go quite high level into those i will share the links for all those podcasts um into the chat during the webinar um, and then just one last thing i would like to say just some other computer vision and production uh community updates is i suppose first off we are looking at creating a community website so it's going to be a launch site that will host all details of previous and future events as well as some blogs so it can be stuff that i will personally be sharing maybe non-technical blogs and then also it's going to be open for member submissions so if you're maybe looking for some peer-to-peer -peer feedback or peer-to-peer -peer guidance we're going to hopefully have a, an extra part in there where everyone can everyone can kind of share their information to be reviewed by other like-minded individuals and then we're also looking at creating a form of community ambassador. So if that's something you're interested in, please let me know. A community ambassador would be someone who can either from many capabilities assist me with arranging interviews or podcasts or webinars right through to speaking or looking to get speakers involved. Um, you can actually take part in it as much as you choose or as much as you have time for. And then just a note on future events. Um, so April 14th, we already have the event confirmed. We have the speakers confirmed. We're just looking now at posting the event live on meetup.com, but that will take place on April 14th, same time, 6 p.m. Um, and then we'll also have an event that's going to be maybe a little bit less te technical, but more leadership focused. It's going to be around how to build world-class rock star talents in-house, but instead of letting them or how to how would you look at retaining those talents i suppose it's kind of coming from a hiring manager point of view as everyone wants to hire rock stars how about creating internal rock stars and retaining them so that's kind of what the next uh the next month will look like uh for that so without uh further ado i'm going to leave it up to farshid who if you could jump on give yourself an introduction and um jump into your presentation but everyone thanks for listening i hope you have a fantastic evening uh, at all these fantastic and wonderful presentations that we have ahead of us but um first should take it away thank you thank you very much hello everyone uh, my name is farshi today i want to present object tracking on edge Uh, in the, uh, I'm a, I have a master and PhD in computer science. I have a five years experience in computer vision, and I worked with the various different kind of computer vision in IoT and robotics. And uh, let's uh, start with the hardware. Then we go for the object detection and object tracking. 
for the hardware, I want to show you Miguel hardware here. Okay, I start with the Raspberry Pi. In, uh, in order to run computer vision in different kind of hardware for IoT, I tested many different hardwares and I want to explain each hardware to you and uh, what's the good things about each, each kind of hardware. This is uh, the first hardware I tested a computer vision application in IoT device for Raspberry Pi TV. This is very basic hardware that we can use and we can use only a computer vision algorithm, not deep learning. For example, you can install OpenCV and use your computer vision program. Then we go for the Raspberry Pi 4. Compared to Raspberry Pi 3, it has an advantage of using USB 3. This device can connect accelerator in order to run inference engine of the computer vision uh, deep learning uh, in your hardware. So by using this kind of uh, Raspberry Pi, we can connect, for example, Google Coral or Intel SD. <clears throat> Another good thing is uh, we can connect uh, SSD in order to boot faster and also to uh, store a lot of data on the device. Then uh, we can uh, connect accelerator for running deep learning on the hardware. We can use Google Coral from Google, uh, connect to the USB 3, and uh, you can convert your TensorFlow model to TensorFlow Lite uh, and also run on this accelerator. And this one from Intel, Intel SD2, and uh, this accelerator can run all, uh, can support all kinds of frameworks. For example, you can convert TensorFlow, PyTorch, or CAFE in order to run on this accelerator. But also for these uh, two devices, also you need to convert your model in order to use to this kind of hardware. Then I go for the best solution, uh, uh, Jetson Nano. Here, Jetson Nano from NVIDIA. Uh, you can use this hardware to run any frameworks and deep learning model because also support the CUDA and you can install all the frameworks and library without any converting your deep learning model in order to run on the hardware. So uh, it has a many different versions. It has a two gigabyte version, $59, and it has a, eight, a four gigabyte version. Then we go for the camera. For the Raspberry Pi, usually they use the normal camera, this kind of camera, but uh, this one doesn't have a good accuracy and good quality in order to run your computer vision model. The best solution is a OpenCV AI kit camera. This is two kinds of camera from OpenCV. And uh, it, uh, this one is a normal 4K camera, and this one has a 4K camera plus depth camera. So you can detect the depth and distance of the object. You can create a 3D from environment. And the good things about these two camera is uh, inside the camera has a chip which you use for Intel SD. So when you convert your model to use in, uh, for example, OpenVINO library from Intel, you can run directly to this. So when you attach this one to Raspberry Pi, you don't need to come, uh, use another accelerator to your hardware. That's all about the hardware. Now I'm going to my slide about continuing. Okay, we talk about the hardware. Uh, This is one comparison. Uh, it compares Raspberry Pi 3, Raspberry Pi 3 plus Intel SD and Google Dev for the. And here the Jetson Nano. As you can see, Jetson Nano, we have a different version, and each of them has a different specification. 
I have here a comparison between JSONano and JSON hardware. And also we have an open source hardware, RISC V, and also it has a, a open source chip you can download from GitHub and modify the chip if you want. This is for the future. And here the open CV kit that I show you and some of the application of it. And now I'm going to show about the object detection and the problems for object detection. For the object detection, we have a different uh, categories. We have a classification, which means we classify the object inside the images. Classification plus localization. We localize the object inside the images. We have an object detection. Uh, we have a multiple objects and localize them and instance segmentation. Here's the one uh, simple application is a count number of people in the street. And the problem of this object detection, if you have a multiple images or multiple frames through the, for example, one area, you may count number of people multiple of times because this object is appear in too many frames. The solution is object tracking. In the object tracking, we have many different categories. We have a single object tracking, multi-object tracking, multi-class multi-object tracking, and multi-camera multi-class multi-object tracking. First, we have a single object tracking. For example, this is uh, just track one object inside the video. And for multi-object tracking, uh, we can track the multiple object, for example, multiple people inside the history. And uh, we have uh, many different multi-object tracking algorithms. This is a comparison uh, between YOLO, SSD, FASTRCNN, and FASTRCNN for object tracking. And finally, we have a multi-class multi-object tracking. In multi-class multi-object tracking, we have a different class, which means, for example, human, car, weight, a bicycle and also multiple of times of this object inside the video. So the application should track all of them. There is a many challenge for object tracking and uh, I'm going to show you just one of them is data set. Data set for training object tracking is very important because if you use different data set for training your model, the result will be completely different and the accuracy will be very low. So you need self-collected data set. And uh, in order to show how important it is, this is one example. This is uh, this model based, uh, trained based on uh, their own data set. The source code is here. And the people who research and develop this method train their model on the, their own video as you can see from the top, different viewpoint. And if I run the same model in our data set, which the viewpoint of the camera is different, the result will be completely different. And the accuracy is very low because you see it has a many error. So the data set and training data set is very important. The labeling data, uh, the labeling videos for the object tracking is different within labeling for object detection, because in uh, labeling for video, in order to train your tracking method, will be challenging because you need to uh, also take. Thank you very much. Any Excellent, Farshid. I really appreciate that. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you can ask them live into the chat or into the Q&A box. Um, that's, that's absolutely fine. We will look to answer approximately two questions um, after each presentation, and then we will try to get uh, as many answered towards the end. So just the first one, actually, Farshid, um, I know we've mentioned about you know sharing uh, the video online 
Um, but Daniel has actually asked, uh, would it be possible for you to to share the slides after, um, whether it be with him directly or maybe via sharing them on the the comments window in the meetup page? Uh, yes. If I, I if, uh, if they message me, I happy to share with him or anybody can share, ask me. I share the link and all the uh, documents for this kind of presentation. Excellent, cool. So now look just to get through some of the questions. So the first one is from Mohammed. Um, he asks, "How do you train your data sets? What methodology slash techniques do you use?" For object tracking, I use many different algorithms and methods. For example, for object tracking, I use DeepSort, FairMOT, and MCMOT to comparison uh, with a different data set and different models. Nice, nice. Um, I'm trying to, sorry, I'm trying to look at them with the order. <laughs> the questions are just jumping in. Um, uh, one here is, what is the SOTA approach in object tracking? S-O-T-A. Uh, the single object tracking is the first, uh, first of the category. In single object tracking, we have a just one object. For example, many paper or many researchers uh, just uh, use the uh, human counting or human detection. We have a just single class. But in multi-class, multi-object tracking, we have a multiple class and multiple times of that class inside the video. For example, we have many people and many vehicle inside the video. We track all of them together at the same time. Cool. Um, because these questions have been short, we'll go with one more before we jump into Manuel, if that's okay. Um, it's from Ashe, uh, who's, screaming this, who's screaming this question in all caps. <laughs> <laughs> Can we use hubs to cluster two or more Jetsons together? Uh, can we use hubs? Uh, the Jetson Nano uh, is a very good device we can use, but not for real time, actually. Okay, excellent. Sorry for everyone who we didn't get around to asking all the questions. They've all just come in flying thick and fast. Um, Farshid, really thank you for that. Um, thank you very much. So look, to try and keep this in line, Manuel, if you want to, want to jump in, give a bit of an introduction to yourself and then jump into it. Uh, same again, we'll take two questions after Manuel and then we'll go to Havana and then hopefully we can um, get around to all the questions at the end. We just want to be as fair as possible to uh, keep the speaker's time um, as, as strict to uh, the speaking slot allocated as possible. Um, but yeah, Manuel, away you go. Best of luck. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Anthony. Uh, I'm Manuel Hass. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Datasprey. Um, I will give you a quick introduction in the first two slides what we do at Datasplay before I talk about the quality assurance uh, you can do with deep learning in general. So um, let's jump right into it. So, um, okay, now, now it's changing. Yes, we, we are a startup basically um, two and a half years old now and we do computer vision um, mainly with deep learning, uh, but of course it's only, only a, a certain bit in the application. And uh, we have this mission to make it more accessible. Um, since as you heard before, you need to uh, know what to do with your data, what to do with your hardware, or which hardware to select and so on, and all the training methodologies. So we try to make this uh, more easy. And um, within the company, we, we do individual vision AI solution, um, but we also offer software so customers can do self-service and um, the training and consulting, which goes along. And we also help with optimizing for the embedded inference part. So if you want to bring your model onto an edge device like a Jetson Nano, uh, TX2, Xavi, whatever, um, we have models for that and we can help with that. And we also uh, offer some few uh, pre-trained models where applicable. I come later to that point, pre-trained models, uh, which we think is a, quite an issue um, when, when deployed. Uh, so as Farshid said, 
if you use a pre-trained model trained on different data and used for your application, you might run into troubles. Okay, but so much about uh, me and uh, the company. Um, let's dive to, into deep learning. So um, if we talk about deep learning for computer vision, we have um, stuff like object detection, classification and anomaly detection, which are usually applied and uh, the main areas how we use this is uh, quality assurance, with which uh, is the biggest one. And then we have all kinds of sorting and counting, and uh, especially within the sorting and counting, um, we need to use uh, uh, techniques like tracking, for example, uh, to do so. Um, and there are many applications, of course, but today we are focusing um, on the quality, uh, quality assurance task and what we can do with this. <clears throat> Okay, to give you a quick recap um, on what we need to do to uh, have a deep learning model, um, there are the four stages or maybe five stages, um, which starts with the data acquisition. So we need data to train our models. We need to annotate it. Um, sometimes, usually we need to annotate it um, and then train our model. Um, this is a big part uh, where we uh, can adjust uh, a lot of parameters and uh, also training techniques. and. Uh, up till this point, uh, everything is fine. You can use your favorite GitHub repo, uh, but when it comes to deployment, um, things uh, move to a different world. Uh, what kind of uh, hardware, software you use for deployment, what requirements uh, do you have, and so on. And um, also the nice thing with deep learning in general is that we can uh, use a deployed model for continuous improvement. So if we got new products, we um, have certain failure modes or something like that, we can always add new data and uh, train our model further. And this is the usual approach. We deploy your model with uh, say 99% accuracy or whatever your metric is uh, into the field. And then over the next week, you acquire more data and uh, you tag them and uh, try to get higher to get to four, five, six sigma, uh, whatever the process requires. Um, a quick plug uh, for this um, whole uh, yeah, life cycle. Um, we have two software products, uh, which is Inference DS, which is our edge software, which runs on the edge or on the server architecture, which actually is responsible for data acquisition and the inference itself. And we have the deep learning DS platform where you can use, uh, uh, which you can use for data set management, data annotation, model training, um, and also the, the export of the model. Um, we use um, open formats for this um, in the OMX format. So you can uh, later transfer this to CoreML or TensorT, whatever you uh, like to deploy a model in. Um, Inference DS uh, supports CUDA, uh, TensorT, and also uh, the Intel platform with various backends. Okay, but so much for, for deep learning in general. Uh, let's jump into a few challenges uh, which we face when we deploy deep learning models for vision AI application. And um, the first challenge uh, is always, is my training data uh, representative? I uh, talked quickly about this when I uh, mentioned the pre-trained models. So um, if you have pre-trained models to uh, detect people, for example, and uh, you did this, um, in the Asian region have a, a camera which is located quite highly and then you uh, try to use this for people counting um, at a storefront. Uh, it may be fail or may not be accurate. So um, it's always important to have uh, representative data uh, right from the process. So um, the application should be up and uh, running um, when you collect your data. So uh, that's the first thing. Um, that comes to mind and the next thing is um, that you also need to uh, test your model um, on the same data um, or from the same process, not on the same data, of course, to ensure that uh, you actually test in, in the application itself and um, yeah, not on, not on artificial data or something like this. Um, so the second big question is um, how does a model react to changes in the environment? So for example, uh, we deploy a quality assurance um, application, which uh, tests for defect or something. And we trained it uh, during the winter months and um, we, at Shopflow, we have windows. Um, and in the summer, the lighting condition uh, may change. So uh, is that an issue? And can we detect uh, if 
there's an issue before we actually produce um, pseudo rejects or uh, false classifications or detections at all. Okay, and then a uh, big question is, uh, what are the consequences of a false estimation? So um, depending on where you are uh, in, your, in your pipeline, uh, consequences can be, okay, I got a pseudo reject and uh, this is uh, growing up to costs um, and something. But uh, it can be also more fatal if you if you really uh, rely on the application itself, like in a self-driving um, application, uh, where it's quite crucial if you don't detect um, a person or a vehicle in front of you. And we all know the videos um, of that. Okay, and the, um, if we talk about quality assurance, um, it's always always a trade-off uh, different to some other applications um, if we want to optimize for false negatives or false positives. So um, if we, uh, for example, uh, test for COVID, um, is it worse to, uh, yeah, don't detect the positive uh, case or is it uh, worse to tell some, uh, someone um, she's positive uh, when she's not? So uh, those are crucial questions and uh, you can either optimize for the one thing or for the other thing. It's always a trade-off and you should be aware of that and uh, also um, think about this and apply it in your training methodology. That's very important um, in practice. And um, like we, we talked before and we also had this question in the chat um, uh, when it comes to throughput and latency, uh, what kind of hardware do I have? Um, do I Do I need to have a decision a few milliseconds afterwards after the uh, the check, or can I um, uh, process this asynchronously, um, or also batch process it uh, for later analysis? And uh, is a Jetson Nano enough, or should I move to some uh, more beefy hardware uh, like a full blown uh, GPU or something like this? So this is another uh, thing you should uh, you should check in your application. And uh, a last thing, which is uh, quite specific, often when we deploy deep learning models, we use uh, dedicated um, uh, hardware for that. Uh, maybe an FPGA or um, something like an AI accelerator, like the Intermo videos uh, you just saw um, in Farshid's presentation. And um, what we do for this is we use uh, quantization or pruning uh, to make the model more compact and have a higher throughput, higher latency. But this can have negative effects um, with regard to robustness and also the, the performance itself. And um, we should also, also check for that. Um. Okay, when it comes to quality assurance, um, we can uh, basically use a full range of uh, computer vision tasks at hand. So. Um, in this example, you see um, injection molded uh, filter parts, and uh, you see some some uh, defects like uh, the threading issue. And um, the first two things which come in mind are a classification. So we just classify into good and bad examples if we have enough data for them. Um, so the data balance um, should be um, uh, yeah uh, taken into account or uh, other me measures uh, such as weighing um, the loss on uh, each class, for example, uh, should be considered. Um, but we need to label the data for that. And often uh, in production, we uh, produce a million parts before we see one defect. Um, and we want to, want to make sure we see this defect. And for this, we can use anomaly detection, uh, which is an unsupervised uh, training technique where we uh, recognize deviations from, from the good samples, so to say. So we only need um, good, uh, a data set of good examples, um, which, uh, yeah, is, a, is always um, a bit hard to get because sometimes there are bad examples in it and there are methods for that to uh, filter those out uh, during the training process. Um, but there, with that, there come a few challenges. Um, like uh, in this case, we need to always do thresholding, uh, which um, gets back to the category of uh, yeah, false negatives um, or false positives and how we adjust the threshold. So um, classification is often um, a better choice. But also for um, 
generating the training data for classification uh, models, uh, we can start with anomaly detection. If we uh, go uh, fresh into shop in the, uh, to the application, we can collect data and use anomaly detection for pre-labeling and uh, afterwards uh, checking back if the, if the categorizing um, already works quite well. But it's, since it's very difficult uh, to uh, get a yeah really high um, a really high accuracy with anomaly detection, especially uh, with uh, edge cases. But uh, it's not the only thing we can do for quality assurance. Um, and um, it was uh, quite often shown that um, we also can use object detection and segmentation uh, for finding defects. And if we have enough samples of defects, uh, those techniques can be um, yeah, quite a bit more accurate uh, than the pure anomaly detection or sometimes even classification, depending on your setting. So in object detection, um, we detect the objects in the image and um, regress certain uh, attributes like the, like the height, width, and rotation, for example, or some other attributes. And with the segmentation, uh, we uh, segment a pixel level mask for, for the defect. And um, I guess quite surprisingly, uh, those methods often work more robustly than anomaly detections, uh, especially if you're interested in localizing the defect. Um, yeah, there can be there can be issues with uh, yeah reconstruction based methods um, you often use in anomaly detection. Okay, but we have uh, some other methods. Um, like uh, heat map visualization, um, some of you might know there are various um, uh, methods uh, derived from class activation mapping. So if we have a classifier, we can uh, use this heat map visualization to see uh, where uh, the focus of the model um, is to, to come to this conclusion. So we have here a rather artificial example um, where we want to classify uh, damaged uh, cookies from, from uh, yeah, okay, cookies. And um, we can see in the not okay um, example, we have this area highlighted. So the defect is clearly visible and also in the, in the correct area. But with our okay sample, we can see that the model is focusing on uh, some crumbs on the side. And uh, <clears throat> we did this for an example. So um, the algorithm might not be checking the cookie itself, but uh, focusing on other visual features. Um, which introduced a bias into the data set. In this case, okay, when the when the crumbles are at these positions, um, those were good cookies. And you should check for that if you have some some biases like this in your model uh, to uh, to avoid um, yeah uh, failure modes. And this is uh, quite nice, and we can use this in a lot of ways. So um, this is an example of a blister pack inspection where we uh, inspect. Um, the pill area, whether it's damaged or not. And we can use the heat map visualization to get more insight where the, the damage is located despite just uh, having a data set of good and bad um, pill area images. And you can see quite nicely here, uh, a small a small hole is detected and here also the damage and the wrinkles um, are quite nicely localized. Um, let me give you a quick video. Um, uh, this is from our collaboration with our hardware partner, ADLink. Okay, now I need to need to see on the second screen how to start the video. Sorry for that. Um, and you see in the top right the um, the image itself. You see in the middle the areas um, for region of interest classification, and on the bottom right you see the heat map visualization. I want you to focus on the heat map visualization, um, so you get an idea on uh, how this might look like and especially the case uh, where it's not quite clear where the damage is located. Uh, I come to that in a second. So in this instance, uh, all the blister packs are damaged, which is correct. And we can see that um, they are, let me stop the video real quick. And we can see that uh, uh, sometimes the uh, area is correctly highlighted where the damage is located, but other times uh, it's all over the place and we can't uh, tell um, which area is responsible for the classification of the um, of the defect, and I and I come to this in a second. So, for example, in this top left area, um, 
there's no defect present, but we still have a high activation in, in that area when using uh, this technique. Oh, okay. And that was uh, the last example. Okay, let's jump into a, a case where it's not quite clear where the damage is. So um, in this case, um, we we have the heat mode visualization. Um, we have a damage in the in the top right in in this area, which is also a bit highlighted. But you can see the the whole region um, is is pretty much focused. And uh, this comes to a false model selection or at least um, an input uh, dimension selection. So if we use a, a small input dimension and we use a very deep model, uh, we have a large receptive field. So the decision neurons uh, see a lot uh, or ca can see a lot um, of the area of the image and um, therefore might generate a high um, activation even though they are not uh, located uh, directly or the filter is not lo located directly over the damage itself. And uh, we can counteract this by using a smaller model or a higher uh, input dimension. So uh, this effect is, is less present. Um, let me jump back uh, to, to this one. And here we use a, um, a not so deep model. And um, you can clearly see that the focus area um, is not as widespread as before. Okay, so what can we do um, for countermeasures? The first thing I already talked about, um, we have to, to select the uh, appropriate input dimension. Uh, is it too big? Is it too small um, to, uh, regarding your use case um, or, or a deeper or not so deep model? Uh, to adjust the receptive field and the classification level. Um, you should always measure the uh, classification uncertainty to react to environmental changes. There are methods for that, like uh, Monte Carlo dropout or some other uh, methodologies um, uh, which can yeah, accomplish this. Um, we can also use techniques like test time augmentation, where you um, use augmentations uh, to classify an Im image uh, multiple times with uh, some changes to it and uh, average the, um, the classification um, output to uh, yeah, get, a, get a more robust um, estimation and also see if your variance is um, rising. With this, it's always important to think about which augmentations are suitable for your use case. So um, uh, if we have um, yeah, um, uh, if, if we can if we can mirror our uh, samples without changing um, yeah, uh, the thing we want to know, um, for example, we should use that. But if we change uh, something like brightness, where uh, we only generate white pixels or something like this, uh, which can be detected as anomalies, uh, we don't um, we or we shouldn't use this. So keep that in mind if you use text and augmentations, also augmentations during your training your team. Okay, and, uh, the, the most important part is um, you should check if uh, we, you can use a classification or detection or segmentation algorithm um, for your quality assurance application instead of anomaly detection, uh, since we have uh, much more um, possibilities to um, yeah, adjust the model, adjust the training procedure um, to optimize for, for certain bits like false negatives or false positives. And um, yeah, if, if possible, use this, but you can also uh, always use anomaly detection for um, pre-sorting your images. And um, if you can, if your hardware is beefy enough, if you don't have requirements uh, with regard to latency or throughput, um, I don't use pruning or quantization, uh, which can be very hurtful. Um, in use cases, uh, especially if it comes to um, yeah, detection segmentation models. Um, yes. And as a last um, quick plug, um, I talked about our two software components, um, uh, Inference DS and Deep Learning DS, which helps uh, with um, developing such an application. And most of the stuff I told you about today uh, can be done directly via those two software platforms. So Deep Learning DS is a, a 
software solution where you can use data set, where you can use data set management, uh, you can do the annotation, classification, object detection, and so on. And you can also train your model and we offer um, uh, uh, over 60 different model architectures with several adjustments um, suitable for your task. Um, and we have all the metrics and uh, tests and training procedures integrated without writing code. So you have a, um, yeah, a process pipeline um, which can be reproduced and um, also your data is not living on some place uh, on, on some server, uh, but you can also version your data uh, to get a more uh, accurate and reliable process going. And uh, the other part, once we trained our model, uh, we can export it and um, put it into Inference DS for deployment. And in Inference DS, um, which uh, is, a, is a, almost a headless application, we have several plugins where you can connect to um, uh, vendor dependent um, industrial uh, imaging solutions or camera interfaces. So if you have a, a Basler or IDS or, or a ZIG sensor, um, you can integrate this uh, without writing code. Um, you can uh, customize your pipeline. So from, from the input pipeline, uh, then you do some pre-processing, then your model inference, then you want, if you have an object detection model, you can, you can put tracking on top of it. And on, on top of tracking, you can, for example, uh, use a counter uh, with counting lines, to, for example, count people or some other stuff. Um, and all this is uh, quite hardware and uh, OS agnostic. So we run on ARM and X86 um, devices on uh, Linux and Windows. And as I said, uh, this is a headless application, but we have this front end um, to con configure your application also from remote uh, without using code and also checking each processing step um, in between and also can, can use stuff like this uh, heat map visualization or other techniques um, to get more insights in your model and also the output interfaces for uh, transferring this to your PLC or your data storage or whatever you want to put your data in. Okay, I think I'm, I'm uh, already a bit uh, over time. Thank you very much. Um, contact me or uh, visit our website uh, data-spree.com um, or shoot me an email or call me. Uh, thank you. Back to you, Anthony. Thanks, Emmanuel. Really, really appreciate that. Um, thank you so much. Fantastic presentation. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, I suppose the first one is from Daniel. He asked, do you optimize adversarial sample generation as well? Uh, yes. So one example is um, that you train on adversarial uh, images all, also if you have a class classifier um, and it's uh, pre-trained already um, you can integrate uh, fast the fast gradient sign methods to generate adversarial samples to uh, enhance the robustness um, you can you can use that and you can do that with our platform excellent um, another one from daniel i think you may have answered it um throughout but he asked do you use third party uh, frameworks Intel Altera for quantization on FPGAs, or do you use your own? Uh, no, we, we use uh, don't we don't use our own. Uh, people can do, to do that better than us, but uh, we use that to export um, the, the model. Um, so we you export it as an ONNX um, file, and from that on, you can usually go through most of the quantization platforms. Um, for us, it works with Intel, PyTorch, um, so you end with CoreML or something like this. Excellent. And um, we'll look again, pretty, pretty straightforward question. So we'll take one more before we move on to the next one from Miguel. He asked, have you developed your own tools for building your machine learning pipeline or do you use open source ones? And if so, which tools are the ones you choose? Yes, uh, so good question. So uh, the algorithm itself, we develop ourselves, but um, we use, of course, open source software uh, on the basis of that. So we uh, don't uh, develop 60 models, but uh, we use reliable sources for that to don't uh, have issues with that. But everything on top, like training methodology or which detector we use or something like this, this is all um, our, own, our own software. And um, I can say that in the back end, we use PyTorch. Um, Yes. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. 
Um, thank you, Manuel. And now our final presentation of the evening, Ivana, thank you. If you want to give a short introduction to yourself and then kick off into your presentation, for those who have questions outstanding for Manuel, we will get back to them after uh, Ivana's presentation, if you can just hang on with us. Thank you, Manuel, and good luck, Ivana. Uh, thank you, and hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ivana. I work as a senior machine learning engineer at Tuplux, uh, where I'm also a technical lead. And today I'll be talking about uh, generative adversarial networks, especially for creative applications and art. So this is more related to, to my side project that I actually uh, did recently and I am quite hyped about. Uh, yeah, so um, a short uh, outline about the talk. I will mention three of my projects that I did, which are related to AI art. And then I will go into technology behind it a little bit. I will tell you about uh, StyleGen2 ADA pipeline that actually was very helpful for training of the models, as well as Outdoor Reactive GAN. And in the end, I will uh, give you a little bit of tips for those of you who are thinking about training their own, their own uh, generative adversarial models. Uh, yeah, so uh, short intro, uh, digital and AI art is actually a thing that is talked about quite a lot recently. A couple of years ago, a portrait of Edmond Bellamy, the one that doesn't exist, uh, was sold for $400,000. And a couple of days ago, NFT art, NFT is now ranging, and people sold his work for uh, $69 million. So digital art gets, uh, gets really popular right now, and also uh, it, it consumes huge amounts of money. So is it something uh, of the future or not? That's, that's an open question. So the first thing that I did with AI art was actually to try to combine analog photography with GANs. Uh, as I'm a photographer myself, I had a lot of shots uh, made on a film and I used those images to, to generate abstract art. So uh, by preparing some crops of the data, I wanted to recreate the magical grain and feel of analog photography and was actually interested whether the generative adversarial networks are able uh, to capture those th things and also to play with the forms in the uh, multidimensional embedding space. Uh, so I collected around 1,000 images from my film archives. Um, I did a bit of data augmentation, so I prepared some random crops of those images. I wasn't looking for a particular um, forms or shapes in there as I wanted to create abstract art. It didn't really matter whether the crops were made in the center of the image on the outside, um, whether they contained parts of humans, of other concepts. A lot of those images were also shot at night with uh, low lightning conditions. So this is something where I tried to capture the grain and the texture of the film. Uh, so the size of the images that I did was 512 by uh, 512 by 512 pixels. So this is already something that uh, we can work with and uh, have have some images generated. So this is a snapshot of the data that I used for the training. As you can see, it uh, contains a lot of different concepts: um, humans, places, lights, skies, etc. Uh, now, after the uh, first 100 epochs of training, some of the textures started to emerge. So this was actually very good to see. As you can see here on the images, uh, there is uh, some, uh, some grainy uh, look of the film photographs. And as the training progresses, some of the other more complicated shapes start to emerge. They still don't look like anything that we know. Mm, as the concepts that were represented in the data set, they were not very, mm, very uh, frequently represented. So these are still more on the abstract side. But as you can see, these are already some interesting looking images. 
And as the training got on, after 1,000 epochs, we can either even observe some of the uh, more complicated concepts that look a bit like Jean Miro's painting, and even there is an eye that looks like a human eye. So you can see that some of the concepts were more prominent in the data set, and then they were actually captured by the models. Uh, the second uh, project that I did was I used the photography from the Met Museum's IPI to recreate humans that not only did not exist, but, but also they didn't feel. So uh, you can scan this QR code to, to see a demo of the project uh, as videos are not very good on Zoom. There will be a couple of interactive places in this presentation. And the goal of this project was to provoke empathy in viewer by generating uh, synthetic people also showing the emotion. So probably most of you have seen those artificially uh, generated people. They look quite real, but the goal here was actually to generate uh, the ones that would show some emotion and to provoke some feelings in the viewer. So for this one, I collected images, all the images, all photography works from the MET API. I ran face detection algorithm to only take those images that contained uh, faces. And then also I ran an emotion detection algorithm, pre-trained one uh, that I actually had on a different project to take only images of faces that contained some emotions that were strong receptors for emotions. So usually when we do emotion detection uh, or emotion classification, there are six main emotions. And I didn't take the images that contained happy emotion as I was looking for something uh, that would generate empathy. So feelingness of sadness, of fear, of anger. And those were the emotions I was looking for in the images. And this model was a bit higher resolution, 1000 by 1000 pixels. So here's a sample of the data that, was, uh, that the model was trained on. As you can see, it contains some old photographs, a lot of sepia-like colors. Uh, the quality is, of course, uh, lower, but there is also a texture uh, prominent in those images. So after training the model and using a pre-trained model, actually, that was trained on human faces, uh, the, the style gun was very quick to capture the feelings, uh, the humans that looked very real-like. And what, was I, what I was happy about is that actually those emotions were also present in the images and they didn't have any uncanny feelings in them. So they looked quite realistic, the feelings of sadness, feelings of anger and other ones. So um, it's also on my, on my website or on the video, you can, you can see uh, more examples of those uh, human emotions uh, that I've uh, created. And the third project, um, I was also, uh, I decided to go with my photography and generate artificial data set just for this task. Uh, so here again, uh, if you want to uh, skip ahead to the demo, you can scan this QR code and see the video that was generated in this project. And this one is called artificial still life. So uh, what was the goal here? The goal was to create moving objects from the objects that are occurring around us as we are locked inside our homes. There are glasses, knobs, uh, a lot of different objects that surround us. And I was capturing uh, the images of those uh, in red light, artificial uh, red light. And then I used those images to, to recreate something like that looks like an object, like a still life. And also I opted for a lot of steel, uh, metal, and glass-like structure because, because I was very interested in how GANs will be able to capture the shadows, the transparency, and um, the reflections. So this was, this was the goal of my project. Uh, here is a sample of the data that I used for training. So as you can see, they're all shot in the same lighting conditions. Uh, they are quite abstract in a way that uh, there is some uh, parts of the objects, um, a lot of different ones. Sometimes they are not even recognizable very well. And after training, uh, the objects that were generated looked quite interesting, quite haptic. 
uh, they didn't look like anything, to be honest. So those objects, I could not say if it's a glass or some tool because it's a mix of everything. And it is good. It was actually my intention to create some new objects that don't really exist, but also have those characteristics of reflective uh, materials. So uh, here are some samples uh, that I was able to generate. And uh, yeah, so so now let's uh, let's go ahead and talk a bit more on how it was possible to create all those projects and what is the architecture and technology behind uh, creating uh, the AI art. Now, for the most part, uh, most of the uh, mo most of the visual artworks use GANs, and you've definitely heard about GANs, and they have been with us for quite some time. Uh, since their introduction in 2014. And there has been a lot of change in the development of GANs. So in 2014, the images that were generated, they were very blurry. Uh, they didn't look good at all. Uh, they were like 16 by 16 pixels, not really artworks. Uh, but then a few years went by and more and more realistic images were possible thanks to the use of uh, new tools. Big Gun got introduced, Style Gun got introduced. So there was a whole lot of new tools and possibilities for artists and engineers um, to use. And the architecture that made it possible for me to train those models um, in, a, in high quality uh, was a Style Gun 2 Adia. So, First, there was a style gun, then there was improvement to style gun, which was a style gun too. And then again, there was uh, even further improvement that was introduced um, last year in the autumn by NVIDIA and a uh, team of Carrot and his colleagues. And they introduced a paper with a style gun that had adaptive discriminator augmentation. So this is a new technique that actually allows to train high resolution GANs on uh, small data sets. And it is very efficient. It really works quite well. As you have seen in some of my examples, it allows to train models with as few as 2000 images. Uh, I think 2000 is actually the, the lower bound for generating high quality results. The authors themselves, they say that um, going um, smaller than 2000 actually doesn't make a lot of sense if you want to have a training set that has less than 1000 images it is very difficult to talk about generalization because the sample of the data is just too small so uh, the whole idea of generalizing from that would be mm, non-natural and and this is why uh, that's that's like uh, we guess the lower bound for for those models but but of course nobody knows what the next two years of research are going to bring it. Uh, so the core idea behind StyleGen to ADA is the added augmentations. And the augmentations here um, are not just added to the uh, generator, they are added to everything that both generator and discriminator sees. So the real images are augmented using uh, this specific pool of augmentations. And also the uh, generated images are augmented with the same augmentation. Now, the key thing to note here is that for this idea to work, the augmentations need to be reversible. Uh, but reversible not in the case like single image can be reversed because of course, uh, 90, um, 90 angle rotation is not reversible. If we have an image that is rotated, we cannot say what was the original um, aspect ratio of, of this image. But if the data distribution as a whole uh, is augmented with, with some, uh, some augmentations, uh, they can be uh, traced back to the original distribution if it's uneven um, distribution. So for example, if in our case, we have real images uh, on the left of those humans that are not rotated, and then we take 40% of the images and we don't rotate them, and the remaining ones 
we do 90 uh, angle rotation, 180 and uh, 270. And we do that as well for the generated images as well as uh, real images then the, the discriminator and generator actually are able to learn this distribution and to, uh, to generate the uh, artificial images in a way that the augmented ones will be also in the same distribution of non-rotated and rotated images. So uh, this is a key concept that they use there. And it's, it's important to realize that the um, reversible augmentation doesn't mean that the single image augmentation can be reversed, but they need to be reversible as a whole. So um, on this link, there's also a link to the paper of the authors. Uh, you can read more if you're interested on this architecture, on what are the building blocks. You can also read more on, on Stalgan. Uh, there's a lot of um, interesting sources up there. Uh, but, but the key takeaways here is that it really uh, helps improve the training results and to uh, decrease the number of necessary images to achieve the same quality by a range of almost 10 times. And uh, another thing uh, that I also used during uh, the training of my models was transfer learning for GANs. So this is also something that has not been done so often and so frequently, but more and more uh, people in the research community are realizing that transfer learning is also working for GANs, even if it was trained for a different domain. So in this example on the left, if we have images that were trained and generated on CAD data set, and we try to do transfer learning to um, generate faces, it actually uh, worked quite well. Uh, in the uh, beginning stages of the training, we have some weird structures of half human, um, half uh, animal. But the key concepts that network learns in the early stages, such as um, colors, texture, angles, perhaps eyes in this case, they are also useful when doing uh, transfer learning to, to other data sets. So what I did in all of my models, I actually took the weights that were pre-trained on FFHQ, which is the data set containing uh, many faces. And then I fine-tuned it on my data, even if it didn't contain faces, like in the case of a project uh, where I had still objects. Another thing uh, that, that is an open source tool available um, for trained uh, GAN models is what made it possible to generate a video from my third project where the generated video reacts to music and the shapes, the moving and the latent space of the um, generated um, images um, embedding is actually uh, is reacting to the music. So here's this uh, cool tool. Um, by J.C. Brower uh, that uh, makes it possible to take a pre-trained style GAN model and make it react uh, to, to some music. Uh, there is some fiddling with this one, so I had to change a couple of things so that it could work with my videos and my models, but it, it supports some of the style GAN uh, models out of the box. Uh, one thing to note, it supports the PyTorch uh, weights. So as I was training in TensorFlow, it was necessary to convert the weights from TensorFlow format to PyTorch, but uh, there's also, uh, there are also available scripts uh, that do that, and it's, it's not a problem. Uh, yeah, so, so going forward, uh, what actually would be interesting to do is there are works on consult interpolation. So this is something that I haven't played yet with, but you can change only one feature and only move in one dimension, such as if we are generating humans, we can of course change only hair color or age or other things. So this is, uh, this is something that I already did a little bit when I generated faces showing emotions uh, in the video and the demo, uh, there is movement uh, that is only in one direction. So people are doing uh, some facial expressions, changing them a bit and going from happier to more sad emotion. And also what would be cool to do is mixing up different styles and different models. Uh, now, as 
and a few crazes uh, starting. I also uh, set it up, uh, probably you will mint uh, some of my work on OpenSea. So if you're interested, uh, check it out. And to finish off my talk, uh, I will provide you with some takeaways for training generative models. So uh, when I trained um, my models, what I uh, had is actually, I was very familiar with the data, particularly when I made all the images, all the training images. So I was very familiar with what was in that. Uh, so it was very beneficial to me when I was seeing the initial results of the architecture training. I, could, I was able to say whether some concepts already exist in the data or is it something totally new. And what was evident is actually there are some of the, some of the things, some general characteristics of the data that the GANs are very good at capturing they are very good at, at cheating. So if they notice that there is something in particular with your data, maybe there is a viewpoint that gets repeated quite a lot, or maybe there is a lightning condition, they will capture that very well so that the images look very real. On the other hand, they are not very good at capturing logic behind data. So in one example, I had some uh, text in the images. And what I've noticed, the GANs were very good at trying to do something that looks like text, but it's not legible. There might be three letters or something that looks like a letter, but it doesn't have any meaning behind it. So this is something that would be needed a lot, a lot more data to, to actually uh, work well and to capture some meaningful text if we wanted to have it in the images. And yeah, last but not least, AI is still a tool, not an artist itself. It still needs a lot of creation, and all AI artists out there who are creating work are uh, are also doing a lot of creation, choosing the the final images, uh, fine tuning the models quite a lot, well a lot, and also preparing the training data. So it's very necessary to not to have any garbage in the data because the GANs will be very good at capturing the things that you don't want to in the data. So especially, yeah, so you need to be very careful about what you have there. So if you're generating images for some other solutions as well, it is really necessary to go through uh, the statistics of the data, the outliers to maybe check for some anomalies uh, so that the generated images will not be capturing those if you don't want to. Uh, yeah, so this this will be it from uh, my side. And um, thank you everyone for the attention and I'll be happy to answer questions if there are any. Excellent, Davana. Thank you um, for that so much. Um, I suppose, look, I know one thing that I've always had the question about and I appreciate it's quite it could be quite basic but when it comes to art I've been following a couple of the AI sales as well um quite interesting that some of them are selling for millions as well which is pretty insane my question was is you know does GDPR ever come into it is it like what if someone owns the data but another person owns the algorithm and an artwork sells for a hundred million who gets the money <laughs> yeah that's that's a very good question so actually that was the case with the artwork that was sold a couple of years ago the the dilemma that i shown in the beginning and it turned out that the the team that created this artwork they used of course the open source library uh for stalgan or something similar and they even used a data set that was made by somebody else and they sold it for many uh many uh thousands of dollars so the gdpr didn't came to them but there was a lot of discussion on the internet is that it's open source it's available for for commercial use but but still who gets the credit why is it them who are on the end of this um of this tree of of uh yeah of creating the model then creating the data and then training so uh why shouldn't like the of the artists that uh, the engineers that, that created the model get some credit so yeah that's that's actually a very relevant topic and yeah from what i know it's it's very difficult with open source tools to, to trace it back 
And with NFTs, I think the problem is similar, at least at least the reusability of the artwork is limited as there is the signature of the owners, etc. But still, I wouldn't recommend using like um, a song by somebody and using it in your artwork or training something out of the data set that doesn't belong to you as you might get into some problems for sure. Good, thank you. Um, and then just to go through a couple of the questions. Um, so the first one from Ben Am, he said, is it possible to generate video with GAN where consecutive frames represent meaningful actions? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so generally when the videos are generated with GANs is just stills are generated and then they are, um, they are patched together into one video. And now what the GAN does is they, they not only create images that look real, but the GANs would create the embedding space where each of the points is a meaningful representation of the data distribution. So this is why moving in this embedding space, every point, like in perfectly trained GAN, of course, every point represents a meaningful image, a meaningful data and meaningful object. So this is why you can, if you, if you train, for example, on animals, you can move from one animal to the other in a linear manner and have those weird creatures that are half dog, half horse because the gas wouldn't just train to know that there are horses and dogs, but they will try to, um, to make this space uh, as a whole, to learn this space as a whole. It will not be um, yeah, limited single point on the space, but just full surface. So, so yeah. Excellent. And then um, next question for yourself again, Ivana, it's from Vivek. He says, is there any open source data available for training GANs for digital art generation, good ones? And then how about data augmentation techniques? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so uh, there is one uh, from Matt that has painting, but it has been used so much by so many people that I don't think that there are any more interesting results that can be achieved with this data set, but it looks really well. So if you just take Matt's um, faces data set and you train again, you will be able to achieve some, some results on your own and they'll be looking quite good with this Stalgan architecture. Uh, now, with, with regards to data augmentation, so this is actually what was used in this Stalgen 2 ADA. And they are using quite a lot of augmentations inside, rotations, uh, strong, actually their augmentations are quite strong. They um, even uh, do some, add some noise, which is destructive noise. So they change colors quite a lot. They add, yeah, a lot of different transformations, warping, et cetera, et cetera. So this also helps a lot um, with the training. Uh, so this is why you, you don't actually need to add any more augmentations on your own as, as they are already there. And the pipeline is, is really strong. I would say uh, um, collecting the data on, on your own would still be, be a way to go. Uh, there are many methods you can think of, of like scraping or finding something uh, that, that is related. It's just important to have one concept on which the data is related and then the results might be quite good. Fantastic. Um, Manuel, I see you back there. Um, we have a question from Hardik. He, he asked, um, how do you recommend to deploy anomaly detection application on edge devices, for example, uh, Nano uh, Jetson Nano? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so the, the platform where you deploy your model uh, really depends on the application. So if you uh, don't have issues with time critical applications, you can use uh, even a CPU, which uh, often gives uh, quite a good speed. And Jetson Nano is a perfect platform for this. Once you go into um, the higher resolution regime, you uh, might consider that you need um, some, some memory for that. But otherwise, uh, you can also use your laptop if you want to try out things and then move to your production hardware environment. Perfect, perfect. Good stuff. 
Um, question for you again, Ivana from Jelavish. Uh, she says, super interesting projects that you showed. Uh, can you give some more details about your neural network architecture? Did you fix your feature extractor backbone while transfer learning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I used uh, was, was Pelgan. And um, you don't really uh, need to, to use any, any backbones like you trained on Mentionet. What I did is I used the weights that were trained on FHQ and they were trained on Pelgan. So uh, there are available weights. So similarly, when you do some yeah, feature extraction, um, you can take the pre-trained weights on this particular architecture, uh, which is Pelgan and use them as a starting point. So in the zero epoch, uh, this, this GAN, this generator part would, would just generate images of faces, but as the training progresses, it will start uh, looking as, as your data. So, so there is no feature extraction as this is, uh, this is a generation task. The, um, the discriminator is not pre-trained. So for the discriminator, uh, there is no feature extraction and it just starts from scratch um, from these also pre-trained network that is able to distinguish um, people from FFHQ data set versus not. So that's, that's the only feature extraction that I use. Excellent. Thank you. If anyone has any more questions, feel free to still send them in. We're still answering, still answering them as many as we can. Um, so back to Manuel um, from Namisha says, thank you for the talk. In the classification method you used, there is a large imbalance. How did you take care of that? Can some low rank approximations be used for anomaly detection? Uh, so starting with the last one, um, I'm actually not sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not too familiar with it. Um, but when it comes to class imbalance, um, we basically have uh, the opportunity to do um, oversampling rather than undersampling for your classes and also use techniques. Uh, now, despite the class aware sampling, um, you can also use techniques like uh, balance group, so a group softmax um, for something like this and also weigh your classes accordingly. Um, uh, to their occurrence um, so you can counteract with that but you always have to keep in mind um, uh, what data augmentations uh, has an effect on this so uh, even if you have uh, little examples if, you, if we're not talking about five examples um, then um, if we use heavy data augmentation um, the, the network won't see a sample again too often excellent and then I see Ivana is, is typing an answer for one there so we'll just jump to the uh, other question for you from Varan, um, said interesting R&D around a heat map. Would you have any interesting results which can replace or be used while annotating segmentation? Oh, so, sorry, is it the question for me again? Yes, I, I, yes. I think so. Okay. I, I would guess yes. so because uh, it's, 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 it's <laughs> funny. Some of, them, some of them come up with a time, so you know, some don't. But this one hasn't got a time. But it says interesting oh, yeah. R&D around heat map, which oh, yeah, okay. me to think sure. it was you. So would you have any interesting results which can replace or be used while annotating segmentation? So yes, when, when it comes to um, general annotation, uh, you can use pre-trained or partially trained models to... Uh, generate pseudo labels, uh, which often helps. And for segmentation, uh, most of the tools um, use uh, either pre-trained uh, polygon models, or but the most common thing is to use uh, some form of super pixels um, to, to help with that. Um, yeah, that, that's all I, can, all I can say. If you use the heat map directly, um, you won't get too much uh, valuable results. Um, you have to have a really high resolution. I guess it's up to research uh, to answer that question precisely. Fair, fair. Um, well, look, I, I think that takes us up for the questions. So first off, um, look, if anyone has another one, just you can you can fire them away there. We'll answer them um, if, you, if one comes in before we close out. 
I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Uh, Manuel, Ivana, and Farsi, thank you again for dedicating your evening to presenting back. Um, if anyone has any feedback or anything else they would like to see from the webinars, from the podcast, from the YouTube channel, you can message me on Slack. I've shared the Slack link in the chat. Hopefully the speakers can join in Slack and maybe if you have any questions for them, you can catch them there or on LinkedIn. Um, as I said, the presentation will go live on the YouTube channel also once it's been okayed by all the speakers, that they, it, that's fine. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then also, look, the podcast, if you're interested in checking them out, we have a new podcast episode every Tuesday. And then, as I said, look, if you're interested in being an ambassador or if you're interested in speaking at any future events, we will have an event every single month. So be sure to tune in. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you, but look from everyone else, I look forward to this being maybe one of the last um, webinars as opposed to a, a personal in-person one, um, hopefully. But when that does happen, we will be recording any live uh, events and streaming them either live or putting the recording on YouTube also. So it does, it does mean that you won't miss out. But uh gonna say just <laughs> just just before we go we've got one question from Farshi from Peter um, he says as far as I know approaches like faster or CNN and YOLO are rather old did you use those for object detection or are there some newer improved techniques that you use yes uh, uh, I mentioned YOLO and other uh, deep, uh, Tra uh, object tracking, as an example, we use many different models. The latest one I use is a fair MOT, and another model is recurrent CNN uh, to use recurrent network inside the object detection for tracking. This is two well-known models that uh, recently proposed, and I check and compare all of uh, all of them also. I this could actually be a good follow up for that far shit, but I've also heard of people having good success with efficient that uh, once they run it on their own customized GPU, it gives a much faster um, object detection frames per second. Is that something you have experience with or, you know, do, do you know much about it? No, I didn't uh, make it specific because I just test all the hardware and comparison them. Of course, if we have a for a specific hardware, a specific GPU, we have much much more faster version of the tracking. Yeah, for anyone interested in that one, there's a Berlin-based startup called Signatrix. They have open sourced their code uh, for their trials that they've done on Efficient. Uh, um, good company to check out. They're they're really interesting. Maybe yeah, Efficient. Uh, I think it's one of the state of the art right now. There have been like some papers that they've shown that they're really good, yeah. Yes, there are some maybe, improvements. Maybe some Sorry. insights, uh, since uh, object detection is one of our core technologies um, and um, we have uh, quite a good success uh, with variations of uh, the center net algorithms um, and we re uh, reach uh, single, single digit millisecond um, inference times depending on uh, certain parameters. And they're also also quite good, um, also compared to um, efficient debt detectors. Um, so maybe check them out. Um. Yeah, definitely appreciate that, Manuel. Um, so yeah, Jelavish, I've just uh, posted the GitHub uh, to the efficient debt trial from Signatrix into the box there. So if anyone, anyone has it, um, it's in there. And I think this one is just for you, Farshid, again. Uh, Peter just asked, the neural network you used was a recurrent CNN, MOT, and efficient net? Uh, no, efficient net is another type of uh, feature extraction for tracking object. Recurrent CNN is another type of model. They combine all two stages together in order to solve the uh, tracking and uh, feature installation in one model. We have a two kind of solution. Most uh, model use two stage, one for object extract, uh, extract the features of the objects and use, for example, Kalman filter to try that features. Another one combine these two together as a one model. 
This is from the one model. And the author of this paper mentioned more than 100 frames per second, uh, they can uh, object tracking. Excellent. Fantastic. I appreciate that. Everyone else for those uh, answering those questions, Manuel and Ivana, thank you. Hopefully, if anyone has any questions, maybe that they didn't want to ask over the, the webinar, maybe you can ask them in Slack. We're very happy to answer them there. It'd be great to get a bit of a buzz going on the Slack channel too. Um, but for everyone else, thank you. Have a great evening and a happy belated St. Patrick's Day from me. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.